And it's a, a wonderful thing to study through the book of Zephaniah. Uh, uh, I'll tell you that uh, this book has been outstanding for me personally uh, to see some seemingly undeniable truths about what God says about the future and uh, uh, to simply submit to that, to submit to that. Uh, please know that there's nothing in the New Testament that says that what Zephaniah says is not going to happen. Um, as, as a matter of fact, the contrary is true. Uh, everything is consistent. Uh, what we just read out of Revelation 19 includes a, a reference to Isaiah, uh, to the, uh, the, the supper of God in which the birds will participate uh, because of so many of the enemies slain by God. And so um, that's what the Bible says, and that's what we're going to, to see today. Now, we're looking at Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. I've told you that Zephaniah is very typical of the prophets. And what I mean by that is you can find the themes of Zephaniah in all of the other prophets, uh, at least the, the ones who are not devoted specifically, but they're all consist uh, specifically to a particular group uh, like uh, um, Obadiah with Edom or something like that. Uh, but even that theme fits Zephaniah's message. Uh, if you wonder what's going to happen, I'll tell you a better source than, than Fox News is the Bible. Uh, it, it tells you what God's purpose is. His purpose is that he will be glorified. Uh, his purpose is that he will be glorified by a people for his own possession. Um, and it tells from beginning to end how he has, is bringing that about. And, and so we can go with confidence to God's word and know uh, that we're reading about God's plan, his purpose, and what he wants us to know. Uh, we can find it there. We have to admit that when it comes to some of the details, they are not explicit in Scripture. Uh, but there are a lot of details that are explicit in Scripture. And when we find explicit statements, and by explicit I mean the words are simply there. I'll give you an example of a doctrine, that salvation is by grace through faith. Is that explicitly stated in the Bible? Okay, it says in Ephesians 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? So that's, you don't have to make an argument to try to explain that. Uh, and there are strong, strong doctrines that are strongly implied to the point of being undeniable. For example, the Trinity. There's not an explicit passage that says this is the doctrine of the Trinity. That word is not there. But it's undeniably true for those who take the Bible for what it says. We're looking at some explicit statements and some things that are strongly implied and therefore uh, basically undeniable. So we want to see that. Now here's, here's the goal for today. I want us to, and, and the Holy Spirit intends that we, and Zephaniah in giving this prophecy intended that we fear God's judgment. Now that's the number one thing. Don't let your uh, uh, curiosity about what's going to happen in the end times cause you to miss that. That is the big idea. Run from God's judgment. Flee. And here's worse news. There's nowhere to run. And there's nowhere to flee. Uh, God's wrath against sin is the worst possible news. There is no worse news you could get. There's nothing that even compares to that. Because all of us are sinners, God will judge, judge sinners. And there's nobody exempt from that. That judgment. Christ, being the God-man won't be judged. You know why? Because he's perfect. The judgment is he is righteous. There's a therefore in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, uh, God exalted him to the highest possible place and gave him a name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Lord, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Listen, that's the judgment of God toward Christ. He's given him the highest possible position and the greatest name 
and all others will bow the knee to him. That's the judgment of Christ. Now, everybody else who's lived the human experience, what we're reading about today is what we deserve, what we come, have coming if it's in our own lives. So I want you to fear God's judgment. I want you to look for a place to run, and the only place to run is to Christ. That's the only place to run, not to some other religion, not to other re rituals, not to ceremonies, not to church membership, not to being a good person. All of that will be blown away. If, if Jesus uh, told Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom. You can't even see it. And he was the teacher of Israel. Just know that your religious achievement will not make it either. The only thing we can do is trust Christ. That's our only hope. So number one, fear God's judgment. That's way number one. If you miss that, there's no point in moving to number two. But number two is to see the perfect consistency of the books that we call the Old Testament with the New Testament. It troubles me and grieves me, and I think that we do disservice to the world as we try to explain what we're doing uh, when we treat the books of the New Testament as if they correct and give some new plan of God over the Old Testament. And there are that tendency exists in, in uh, some version of most all theological camps, and we have to be careful of that. If the camp called dispensationalism, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it, but if that camp says that Israel is distinct from the church, uh, know that some people have gone too far with that and have come up with the church as almost a plan B of God as if he tried something with Israel and that didn't work, so now he's going to try something else and see if that will redeem a people for himself. No, God has had the same plan all along. It has been announced from the law, uh, the books of Moses, all the way to the apocalypse of John, Revelation. It's the same plan. It has never changed. God never has had a plan B in anything he's ever done, which is why we can find eschatology, the doctrine of the end times, in the book of Genesis and in the law of Moses. You see, if not details, you see the seed of it there. It's all the way through. It does not change. And I would say if you pause it, well, this changed. We've got a problem. We've got a far more serious problem than how to fill out our end time charts. We've got a God who needed a plan B. And I don't know how to worship him as holy, holy, holy if he can plan and fail in anything. No, he always accomplishes his plans. I want you to see the perfect consistency of what God said in the law, the prophets, and the writings, what he said all the way through the New Testament. If you want to understand God's plan for Israel and the nations, uh, I would suggest make sure you don't read Revelation first to set your anchor. That's the end of the story, not the beginning. I recommend that you not say, all right, I'm going to figure out the end times and go and read the book of Revelation. There is no limit to where you may go there. Now, there's a man who wrote a book, Ray Summers. Uh, Ray Summers uh, wrote Worthy as the Lamb, uh, his commentary on the book of Revelation. I could not agree more with him that that's the theme of Revelation, Worthy as the Lamb. I mean, that's glorious and majestic in truth, right? Worthy is the Lamb. He also said, if you don't have a good imagination... Just don't even read the book of Revelation because you're going, to be caught, you're going to have to use your imagination and creativity to understand the book of Revelation. I could not disagree more with Ray Summers on his approach. Now, that becomes necessary if you need to justify an agenda. It is not necessary, praise God, if you say, I'm going to start in Genesis and I'm going to get the data. What does God say he's going to do? And if that guides you, then you'll be okay. Now, I'm convinced more and more, every moment multiplying by uh, exponentially, that there will be a, a 1,000 year messianic millennial reign on earth. I know that the Old Testament prophets expected that. The only question is is there something in the New Testament that shows us, well, 
they were misinterpreting what God had said. The problem is in our doctrine of inspiration, the only thing that they knew that was scripture is what God revealed to them. And if he preserved and protected them as they wrote what they wrote, then this information that they had actually came from God, right? So now we've got a problem again. If they expected a literal 1,000-year messianic rule of the Messiah on earth, they expected it because of what the Holy Spirit revealed to them that they wrote in Scripture, right? If that's not true, that means that God told them words that he knew they would understand to mean messianic rule on the earth when, he, when God, in fact, did not mean that, and he allowed them to inscripturate it. we got a problem, don't we? Okay. Now, please understand, this is secondary to flee God's wrath. You, you could have all manner of misconceptions about what the Bible says about the end times and be saved if you understand God is holy and I am not. I've got to have a Savior. But once you have him, just believe what he says. <laughs> just believe what he says. All right. So that's our two goals today, to fear God's judgment, number one. Way by far the most important, but connected to it, is to see the perfect consistency of what the prophets have said, particularly what Zephaniah, we're going to look at others, with what the New Testament uh, says. Or at least to understand that it, is, that it is telling us information that is consistent with the New Testament. Uh, I think to understand Israel and the nations, an excellent place to go is Romans 9 through 11. We've already come through that a few years ago, went through the book of Romans. In preaching through that, uh, I became convinced more and more, it's hard to deny what is written on the page, that, um, well, Romans 11 says that Israel's unbelief was a part of the plan of God. And he used their unbelief that the gospel would go to the nations, to the Gentiles. And that he uses the gospel going to the Gentiles and the salvation of the Gentiles uh, to make Jews jealous uh, so that Paul said, so that some of them might be saved. He said, I magnify my ministry as apostle to the Gentiles uh, so as to make Israel jealous so that they see that the nations, people from the nations have a covenant saving relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel. And then one day, the Bible says, Paul says, the Bible says, the Holy Spirit says the deliverer will come from Zion. And when you understand the full implications of that passage, to Zion, and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. So there's the salvation of Israel and the nations and how it particularly, both of those, particularly bring glory to God. It's consistent with Isaiah 49, 5, and 6, in which the Messiah reports, God formed me to bring back Israel and Jacob, but said that's too light a thing that you only do that, so I'll send you as a light to the nation so that my salvation may extend to the end of the earth. You see, none of this is because either Israel or the nations are worthy of salvation, but rather God has decided my salvation will reach people all over the globe. That's why. Now let's read Zephaniah 3, 1 to 8, and think about this topic when God settles accounts. We need to note that our world is living as if this is not a thing, that God will not settle accounts. They are living like the people who lived in Jerusalem that God said he was against in Jerusalem, in, uh, there in Jerusalem. And he said it in Zephaniah 1.12, listen to it. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. I will punish the men who are complacent, those who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good, nor will he do ill. In other words, he is irrelevant in my life. I'll do whatever I want to. I don't care. God is not a, an issue in my life. That's where most of us are in society. I hope none of us in this room, but if you are, please understand that what you're about to hear is what God is going to do uh, to his enemies, even those who are physical descendants of Abraham, especially to those who are physical descendants of Abraham uh, because of the indictment against them for what they ought to have known. You need to know that. Uh, but in our society, either people are, have, have apathy, don't even think about God, or many of them are hostile 
to God, which apathy is another form of hostility to God, and that means there's enmity there. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, and I'll just go ahead and tell you, there's too much here for one Sunday uh, because one of these verses is a comparison of God with the unbelievers in Jerusalem. And I think we're going to have to take a Sunday, Sunday and look at the character of God since Zephaniah did that for us. I don't think we can just say, God is good. Now let's move on to the next topic. Because that, if you don't understand that, none of the rest of it really, really makes sense. You have to understand just how good and holy God is in order to fear his judgment. Zephaniah 3, 1 to 8. Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in Yahweh. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. Yahweh within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their battlements are in ruins. I've laid waste their streets so that no one walks in them. Their cities have been made desolate without a man, without an inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will accept correction. Then your dwelling would not be cut off according to all that I have appointed against you. But all the more they were eager to make all their deeds corrupt. Therefore wait for me, declares Yahweh, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. Father, help us to see who you are. Help us to see the sinfulness of sin, how wicked and vile it is in your sight, how treacherous and traitorous it is for your creatures to rebel against you. And how perfect and pristine and clinically just is your wrath against sin. Help us to see it. In Jesus' name, amen. In Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, God said to his people, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. God warned his people Israel of his judgment of their disobedience from the beginning. I've read where people have said 
God planned for Israel to be his people, but they disappointed him by their sin. And so he came up with a different plan. No, God knew their hearts from the beginning. Their, his choice of them, as well as their disobedience to him, that's all part of God's plan to glorify himself by redeeming a people for himself. You see, Israel had to be redeemed all along. Adam had to be redeemed. Moses had to be redeemed. Abraham had to be redeemed. Moses had to be redeemed. All of them had to be redeemed. None of them were qualified spiritually to be given a list of rules and the plan would be, keep these and then you'll be my people and I'll be your God. As long as you keep them uh, and you're perfect. Because there are no perfect people. It's not like God only discovered Romans 3.23 when he got to Romans 3.23. He knew that all along. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He warned them from the beginning. Listen, in order to see how the books that we call the Old Testament are connected to our present reality, I want to tell you something. I, I, believe, I believe that uh, it is an accurate understanding of, of these verses that we're going to look at. I have to stop short of saying this is absolute certain truth and the correct way to understand this. But I want to share this with you because I want you to see, I think this is beyond coincidence. I think it's beyond coincidence. It, it causes me to marvel. What I'm certain about, though, is that God is in control and that his plan and purpose is right on track and everything that happens in the world is according to his will. Jesus said, a sparrow falls from the sky. That's, if it happens, then it's according to the Father's will. It's, 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 it's his event. That's how uh, detailed his plans are. I want to show you something. I want you to see that this in indictment against Jerusalem did not take God by surprise. He's not angry about it because he thought they were on his side and they betrayed him. He knew about their betrayal and made that a part of his plan from all eternity. And that's true of every individual, by the way. Your love or hatred for him is a part of his plan for all of history from before the foundation of the world and you will bring glory to God one way or the other, either as a trophy of his grace or as a recipient of his wrath. That's true of every person. That's true, that's true as, of Israel as well. I want to show you just a couple of things. We're, we're going to have to go fast lest we be in Zephaniah 3 until the end of the year. But this is important, and we're not trying to rush through Zephaniah. It only has three chapters, and we're in the third chapter. So, But I've told you that it's connected to the, to the prophets and the rest of Scripture, and I want you to see that. So I want us to look at the big picture. What did God say to Israel? What did he tell them? Is it possible that he had an expectation for them that they didn't fulfill, and upon learning that, he came up with a new plan? Is that possible? Or did God tell them from the beginning exactly what was going to happen? Well, here's a spoiler. He told them exactly what was going to happen from the very beginning, although he warned them. I read, I read one uh, book uh, that said that Moses told them that they were going to disobey and rebel, and then he called on them to circumcise their hearts and seek God. And the question was, why would he do that if he already knew what they were going to do? It's like, well, he was a good preacher. He was calling for a response. But listen, there's more to it than that. God is not arbitrary as he meets out justice. Think of a smaller event in time that's not over centuries, but it's over minutes or hours, hours. Jesus told Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. He told him what he was going to do. 
He told him, but I've, the devil has desired to sift you like chaff, but I have prayed for you. And then he starts talking about what he should do after all this happens. So he told him the whole thing, but Peter did it, didn't he? Even after saying, no, I'll die for you before I deny you. Don't let God's sovereign knowledge of what's going to happen tempt you to think, I don't have any responsibility in this. God's going to hold you responsible. You might say, well, how can he do that? That's a question in Romans 9. How is he going to hold me responsible if he's already decreed what's going to happen? Listen, if you let that question be a hang-up to you, you can ponder on it in the lake of fire forever. Don't let that be a hang-up. You know this, God holds you accountable for whether or not you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He does. That's why he su supplied a substitute, Jesus, who's done what had to be done. Now, in, in Deuteronomy verses 28, 29, and 30, there's a wonderful example of God and his relationship with national Israel. God knows that among national Israel, even though they are corporately chosen by him, there are some who are uh, his personally. They are believers. He has changed their hearts. But the majority have not. If there has ever been, if there has ever been a group of people who ought to have, just from proximity to God and his wonderful word and his acts, from witnessing his miracles, from benefiting from his blessing, from feeling his chastening. If there's ever been a people, it ought to be national Israel, right? Which is the point God makes throughout the prophets. It's a point that he makes in Zephaniah. You ought to have seen, that. that is what God says about all humans, you ought to, but you won't. You can't. See, the fact that we, that we can't, that, that we can't love God on our own unless the Holy Spirit enables us to do that, that doesn't change the fact that the reason we can't is because we won't. Jonathan Edwards called our inability to love God a moral inability, not a natural inability. It's not that we lack brain power to comprehend it. I mean, the, the rich young ruler comprehended it, didn't he? He went away sad because he just loved his stuff more than Jesus. He couldn't because he wouldn't. He could not because he would not. And he truly could not, and he truly would not. That's true for everyone. God knew this about Israel. But he gave them this so that as people like us gather and think about it, we can look at it and understand that God gave every reason so that when he got to Isaiah 5, he could say, what more could I have done in my vineyard? I set up hedges, walls of protection. I provided every resource. I should have expected a good crop, but I didn't get it. That's what judgment is. God saying, I should have gotten a good crop. The problem is not in me, it's in you. That is God's judgment of people. It's God's judgment of Israel. In verses 1 to 14 of chapter 28, you see blessings for obedience. In chapter 28, starting in verse 15, for the rest of the time, you see curses. And they include that he's going to send enemies. Look at just a couple of examples here. Verse, verse 33, 32, your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day, but you shall be helpless. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and all your labors. You shall be only oppressed and crushed continually so that you're driven mad by the sights that you see. You can read all about that. We won't... We won't belabor that point. That is the punishment. Read the book of Judges. God uses other nations to take away the freedom and to disperse and to oppress Israel. That's the way he chastens them and shows them you are failing to depend on me. You are failing to obey me. That's what he does. 
That's established clearly in these verses. But I want you to turn to another book of Moses, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 14 to 18. We'll just probably read. Verse 18. Let's read all of it so you understand. This is explaining what God is going to do and how he deals with Israel. In Judges, there is a, there's a cycle. The reason the judges, judges, there's a bunch of them is because it actually happened to the point where Israel repented as a nation. They disobeyed God. God raised up enemies to oppress them. God raised up a judge to help at, because Israel realize we are oppressed. We, God, help us. Help us, God. We repent of our evil. And a judge emerges and leads Israel to fend off the enemies. And now there's peace once again. And the cycle repeats. But there's a, there's, there's a limit to how God, what God will do here. Verses 14 to 18. If you will not listen to me and not do all these commandments... If you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consume the eyes and make the heart ache. You shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you and you shall flee when none pursues you. Now that happened repeatedly in the in the nation the nation's history. Would you agree? Do you get judges? There's lots of times that this happens. But I want you to see something. The next verse, and if in spite of this you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. Okay. Now in the judges there are cycles because they did repent right so you see that it started over then he sent the enemies to punishment they did repent and so then they had peace with God but what about when they get to the point where they finally they don't even care and they will not repent the enemies come and they still don't turn to God they still don't want him God says then I will take the punishment the original one and and I'll make it sevenfold I'll give it to you seven times Now I want you to look in Ezekiel chapter 4. Ezekiel chapter 4. We've got a very interesting passage here. You could read it and start thinking about why did God ask Ezekiel to do exactly what he did, but the numbers are not hard to interpret. Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Now you understand that from the time that we read that in Leviticus up to the time of Ezekiel, Israel has lived this out. They have lived this out a number of times. They've had to deal with the Philistines, and they've had to deal with the Midianites, and they've had to deal with the Moabites and the Ammonites, and and all of these things. And you read, you can just start in 1 Samuel uh, and go through 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, and you can get uh, that history, the kings and what they were up against and how often there were enemies coming against them and what they were going to do. And and, uh, there were a few good kings who did not allow idolatry. Israel, the northern kingdom, went into idolatry and they they were carried uh, away and defeated by Assyria in 722. Ultimately, there's no more cycle. No more cycle. Judah, defeated by Babylon, uh, Jerusalem destroyed in 586 B.C. There's no more cycle. They're gone. But people aren't there anymore for the most part. Ezekiel, look what he says. Ezekiel 4, 4 to 6. Lie on your left side, place punishment of the house of Israel upon it. For the number of days that you lie on it, you bear uh, you shall bear their punishment. For assign to you a number of days, 390 days, equal to the number of the years of their punishment. 
300, 390 years of punishment for Israel, right? Uh, so long shall you bear the punishment of the house of Israel. When you have completed these, shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the punishment of the house of Judah. Forty days I assign you a day for each year. It's 40 years of punishment for Judah, right? So that's 390 and 40 taken together. And listen, that's one of the things that makes this from being dogmatic and certain. But it seems reasonable to say the total amount of punishment that God has decreed against his people is 430 years. Now in Jeremiah 25, he says this is the ultimate, this is the end of the cycle. He's telling them, you need to understand Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. It's not going to be that Jerusalem needs to be delivered. There's not going to be a Jerusalem. That's what he's saying. And he said this, 70 years is the length of time you will serve king of, of Babylon. He said it, uh, Jeremiah 25, 11, you can go look at that. We won't take the time to do that. 70 years. Now, now we've, did that happen? That happened. You don't have to be a Christian or a Bible believer to know that that happened. Just look up history of the world. What happened? That happened. Did it happen for 70 years? It happened exactly for 70 years. You don't have to be a Bible scholar or a Christian or a Bible believer. That's just what happened in the history of the world. 606 BC, Nebuchadnezzar shows up threatening Jerusalem and makes Jerusalem uh, give tribute to him. He took away slaves from, from the people. Uh, he imposed taxes and they were now under the servitude of the king of Babylon, 606. It's because they rebelled against it and the Jeremiah, don't rebel against This is God's punishment. Accept it. If you rebel, you'll be utterly destroyed. They did, and they were utterly destroyed in 586. But 70 years after 606, guess what happened in 536 B.C.? There's a story that you've heard about of the writing, the handwriting on the wall. That was exactly 70 years. Well, that event wasn't, but that was 70 years later. While that was happening, as God decreed uh, to Belteshazzar, the, that his kingdom, he had been weighed and found wrong, wanting, his kingdom be taken from him. The Persians were at that moment coming into the city and they conquered them. And Cyrus, the king of the Persians, decreed that the Jews could go back. Seventy years of punishment and now they're allowed to return. But you know what happened? They did not return, most of them. 49,000 or so of them went back. Most of them decided life in Babylon is good. I welcome our new Persian overlords. Let's see, let's make a go of it here. But that's not where they were supposed to be. They did not return. Well, what happens? What is this 430 years? Here's the problem on the calendar. When, when you look on the calendar of what happened 430 years after the time that Ezekiel said it, here's what happened. Nothing. There's no event that seems significant. But remember what we said, what we saw in Leviticus, seven times, sevenfold. Well, now let's apply that. We started out with 430 years total, right? They served their 70 year. That was a, that was a punishment that they were given. That would leave 360 years of their, of their punishment that was not served. They did not repent. If you multiply that by seven, uh, what you get is 2,520 years. Now, these are biblical years. They're not based on our calendar. They're years of 360 days. So in, under, other, in order to say, well, let's go to the point on the calendar after this time and see maybe that's when God uh, told them that their punishment, uh, specific punishment had run out. And by the way, this punishment is national and corporate. It's not individual for salvation or damnation. There's overlap because of the people making up the nation, but, but that's not what we're talking about. Well, here's what you do. You take that 2,520 years of 360 days, you multiply it to get the total number of days, which is 907,200 days. If, if... If what we're supposed to do is add the number of Ezekiel's prophecy of punishment, 
to 430, 390 and 40, Israel and Judah, 430. If you take the 70 that they did serve Babylon off and had an opportunity to go back and you multiply the remaining, that means they have 907,200 days of punishment. Well, if we move for, if we, to get that on our calendar, we divide that number of days by 365.25. And you come up with 2,483.8 years from 536 B.C. Guess what year you come up with? And as a matter of fact, you come up with actually, if you do the days, come up to a day from the date of Cyrus's decree. One of the, one of the uh, proposed dates of Cyrus's decree. It doesn't have a date on it like we would understand it. We can't just say, what date did that happen? Well, that happened on March 3rd. We don't, we don't have that date. But what I'm telling you is if you go 2,483.8 years from the time of Cyrus's decree, given a reasonable approximation from that, if you do the 907,200 days, you land on May 14th, 1948. Now, is that a, anything significant happened in Israel, May 14th, 1948? The state of Israel was declared. It has to be noted, for my credibility as a preacher, I want to tell you, it has to be noted, the exact starting date for the time of punishment and the way that by adding the numbers, there's nowhere in Scripture that says you need to add these and get a total of 430. That's not in the passage. But I do find it very interesting that everything that we looked at is in the Bible. I will punish you, and if you don't listen, then I'll multiply it by seven. He punished them. Ezekiel gave this mysterious number of years, which if you just apply it, doesn't lead to anything. But if you take the amount of time they had already been punished and served and you multiply it by seven like God said he was going to do in Leviticus, you get to 1948. Now listen, the reestablishment of the state of Israel does not mean the salvation of a single Jew. As a matter of fact, the majority of them right now, if they died, apparently would die and go to the lake of fire. But what I want you to see is that God has a plan Go back and read Romans 9, 11. The unbelief of the individuals or even the majority does not change God's plan. It's all according to his plan. Now, let's, let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. I want you to avoid thinking that the New Testament represents a different plan than what God had in the Old Testament. I believe that's a lie from the devil that it causes confusion. The new covenant is not, uh, a, does not represent a change of plan from the old covenant. The old covenant was for national Israel. The Mosaic, I'm saying the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant was for Israel and it was for a purpose of leading to the new covenant. It was never the way by which Israel would be saved. Not a single person was ever saved by keeping the law. None ever, nowhere except Jesus. He didn't need to be saved. See, that's kind of circular. If you don't break the law, you don't need to be saved. So the law was never given for the purpose of here's how you get saved from God's wrath. God never thought this is the plan. He never thought that. Okay, Deuteronomy 30, verse 1. When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, right there, we know God knew you're going to experience both of these. You're going to be blessed briefly for obedience and intermittently and from time to time, but you're also going to experience the curse. When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where Yahweh your God has driven you, and return to Yahweh your God, you and your children obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, Then Yahweh your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. He will gather you again from all the peoples where Yahweh your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, and from there Yahweh your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. 
And Yahweh your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And Yahweh your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Now listen, there's a couple of things that are jumbled up a little bit, but one of the things about the chronology that I want you to see here is that when you start, when you look in verse 3, there is the gathering again, and then in verse 5, uh, in the land, and then in verse 6, God circumcises their hearts. Now there is a, there is a when then in verses 1 and 2. I believe there's a relationship between, between uh, serving God, making a choice to serve God, and coming into the land. But I don't think it's necessarily because of this passage and a lot of other chronological so that God is saying, if you'll repent to me in the lands, then I'll put you in. Because he says over and over, I'm going to put you in the land and you will be my people. That's actually the language of the new covenant. In the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, we'll look at in, in a coming Sunday, Lord willing, you see that the, the replacement, the change of the heart happens first. And then he restores them and gives the city limits of Jerusalem, basically in Jeremiah 31. Now, I debated on whether to, to spend the time to do that that we just did, but I want you to see that what God has said in the law of the prophets and the writings and the books that we know of Genesis, Genesis to Malachi, that is important for what's happening right now. Even if I later decide, okay, the starting dates, maybe that doesn't work. That doesn't change that. I don't see how, how what we looked at today would be refuted. God is not intending to write down a proof and give it to us like that. But he is intending to be understood. And what he's communicated to Israel, everyone ought to be able to look at what we looked at today and say that uh, it seems like, it seems like God put Israel as a nation back on the map the exact day that he intended that to happen from eternity past. Now you can also study, and I recommend this in, in Daniel, looking at the time period, the 69 weeks, and this is another thing, we won't get into this, but you could Google it and, re and read and see that the exact date that Jesus entered Jerusalem, that day was prophesied by Daniel. That's there. I want you to see this. I don't want you to think, well, what we learn in Genesis to, Rev uh, Genesis to Malachi is different, and we apply New Testament hermeneutics uh, to understand this. No, it's all the Bible. It's all the Word of God. Progressive revelation. We know more on this side of the cross. We know more details. Abraham was saved by Jesus. He did not know Jesus' name. Okay. We do. We know these details. Now, in conclusion, we, I have to, I told you my number one goal is that you fear God's judgment. And we have taken some time for you to see that God's word affects you right now. His plan for the globe is revealed in Scripture. If he's that precise, if he's that precise in his dealings with national Israel, please know that he will be that precise when he says, my decision is to gather nations to assemble kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, and the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. There will not be a person who escapes that because they're a good person. There will not be a person who escapes that because they were a church member, because they went to church, or because their parents were Christians, or any of that. The only way for that to happen is for, for it to be declared that that has already happened when it comes to your case. Did you know that? God never lowers the standards and leaves sin unpunished. In Exodus 34, he says, I have mercy for thousands upon thousands, for generations, and I will by no means clear the guilty. Now, how can both of those things be so? The way that they're both so is like this. 
the guilty get punished. Here's the good news. My punishment, I'm personally not going to take it. I deserve it. I should be. But I have a substitute who took my punishment for me. So from God's perspective, that justice has been meted out. Do you know who it was for my sake, for all believers' sake, for all Christians' sake, who experienced having all of God's indignation poured out upon him, all of God's burning anger poured out upon him, who experienced the fire of God's jealousy. Do you know who that was? That was Jesus. The only way to flee God's judgment is the gospel. Are you ready to meet your God? Are you ready to meet this God who knows you better than you know you, who, who knows everything? And the Lord Jesus said, every idle word, you'll answer for it. I don't know what all or idle words you've issued that, out of your mouth. I don't know how many uh, jokes you would be ashamed of before God. I don't know how many bits of gossip and slander and complaint and grumbling and mumbling. I don't know how many stubborn arguments you've made that you'd be ashamed of before God, but He knows all of them. He knows every one of them. And you'll give an account for every idle word unless Christ has already received that punishment. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made Him to be sin for us, the one who knew no sin. He made Him to be sin for us. Jesus was made to be sin for us so that we might be, we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's the only way to flee the wrath of God. Run to Christ. Run to Christ. This judgment is certain. It is certain on the Jews. It is certain on the nations. We'll get into this next time, but when he says my decision is to gather nations to and to assemble kingdoms, that has an implication both for Israel and the nations because he gathers them around Israel and they're experiencing the time of Jacob's trouble uh, because of that persecution and oppression that's happening. But in that gathering, in that moment, he's going to, he's going to what we read from Revelation, destroy them with the sword of his mouth. And then those who survive, he rules with a rod of iron. He establishes peace and justice and righteousness. And that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Trust God. Fear his judgment. Run to Christ. That's your only hope. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that your response to the sinfulness and the rebellion of mankind against you was not to simply destroy us, to cast us in the, in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels, but that you have chosen that your creatures will bring glory to you. You purpose to... Seek and find worshipers who worship you in spirit and truth. And you're going to have that. And so thank you for the grace that changes us ultimately into perfect worshipers appropriate for your presence and glory. Help us to see, Lord, the vileness and the wickedness of sin and rebellion against you. Help us to devote ourselves to you. And we know that it, it is only by grace, through faith, in Christ, that this happens. Lord, I pray if there's someone here who is even now in danger of the lake of fire, in danger of feeling the, the wrath of your indignation and your burning anger, oh God, show them the way of Jesus. Help us to be clear about it, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name.